1947 that we today have an epidemic of child abuse on our hands. Now, the, f the final thing I have to share about this, and then we're going to be uh, closing for the break, is the meaning of this. And this is a very mysterious symbol, which, uh, you know, you've heard all sorts of explanations for it, but I'm going to give you the, the Masonic Illuminati inner meaning of what this means tonight. And it's going to probably gross you out and astonish you, and I apologize in advance for that. But this is what it means. Crowley reveals the secret behind the all-seeing eye symbol in one of his books, the Book of Thoth, which is a very advanced manual on tarot card readings. And um, this is the eye of Lucifer. But believe it or not, it corresponds to a human organ that for lack of a more delicate term we'll call the rectum which is kind of ironic when you think about it that this represents Lucifer. And what this refers to is that the occult archaeometric doctrine of masonry is that by accessing alternate universes through sodomy, especially of young boys, you can access alternate dimensions of reality through what are called the tunnels of Typhon. Now you remember I showed you earlier a map of the Tree of Life. Well, Everything in magic, like everything in the occult, has its yin and yang. It's positive and it's negative. It's good and evil. There's always this dynamism. And so therefore, just like there is a tree of life, there is also a tree of evil. This is called the klephot in Hebrew, which translated means harlots. And you'll notice here that all of the names are all evil. And these Typhonian tunnels are the paths between these ten evil worlds. Now, if you want a little bit more on this than I have time to get into right now, you can read the book Lucifer Dethroned because it go does go into it. But here is what is ultimately involved. They, there is a belief that through this sexual perversion, they can access these tunnels into alternate universes, alternate realities. And the goal of this kind of magic is to find your own universe and become the god over that universe. This buys into the, to the modern day physics theory that there's many, many dimensions of reality. I, maybe you've read about that. Alternate universes. It shows up in science fiction a lot. And, and then once you're the god of this universe, you can start sucking the energy out of it. And you can use that energy through this child to live forever and ever and ever. And there are men, I, I, I have met several that claim to be hundreds of years old. Now, of course, are they lying their lips off? I frankly think they are. This is a deception. Satan is deceiving these people to draw them into all kinds of profound evil. But the, the important point is not, does this really work? The important point is, do these people believe it? And sadly, they do. And this broad genre of magic is called, and here's a nice big word for you, transuguthian magic. And all that means is, is it's, it's magic that goes into transplutonian space, space beyond the planet Pluto, which they believe is beyond the pale of the sun and therefore beyond the pale of the Judeo-Christian God. They believe there are gods out beyond Pluto that are far more powerful and far more dangerous and far more deadly than either God or the devil. And that's what these beings, these men, are trying to access. Now, please understand me. I can't say this strongly enough. Only probably one or two out of a hundred Masons is doing this. But that's more than we need. Amen? I mean, we're getting... This is such a problem that we are actually... I now know of five national support groups that are helping people that are survivors of Masonic ritual abuse. This is that serious a problem. And let me tell you something else. The other 95, 96, 97 Masons have an even bigger problem because the spiritual headship over their organization trickles back down to this monster. And because of that, even if they're good men, even if they don't know about this, you know what happens? They begin to struggle, even if they're Christians, with profound temptations 
to move in this area of pedophilia and homosexuality. And this is dangerous stuff. I mean, this is spreading throughout the world like a plague. We have organizations like NAMBLA, the National Association of Man-Boy Love, which their slogan is sex before eight or it's too late. And they're trying to lower the age of consent to eight years old. And all of this can be laid at the door of this occult monstrosity. Now here, here's the issue. Just like, you know, we have a saying in the state where I come from. You lie down with dogs, you get up with fleas, amen? If you're a Mason and you're in an organization with this kind of spiritual headship, this is all around you and you don't even know it. It's like a fish swimming in polluted water that's full of spiritual sewage. And you can't help but take this into yourself. And even if you're a Christian, this is going to have an impact on you. Even if you are, I mean, even in my case, and I wasn't a Christian at this time by any extent of the imagination, but it's important to understand that in all of this, that I myself, as a normal, red-blooded, heterosexual, was finding myself continually drawn into sexual thoughts and sexual fantasies about little boys. I thank God I never acted on any of that. But it was being forced on me because I was under the umbrella of the Masonic leadership. And it, it, it is really a very tragic thing. But it is, it is very real, this kind of headship. So the, the bottom line here is that you cannot be a part of this and be a follower of Jesus Christ. I heard another brother say it this way, you cannot at the same time be, in, be an intelligent Mason and an intelligent Christian. It's that simple. Now, people ask me, what's the big deal about all of this? And I, I'm going to end this with something a little bit more uplifting because I know that probably just demade, this made the living daylights out of everybody. Um, this is a very important symbol in masonry and in, this, and in Satanism. It's called a trapezoid. Doesn't it bother you a little? Doesn't it look unfinished somehow? That's the idea. In architecture, this is called a frustrum because it frustrates people. And this is believed by masons who understand this stuff to be the ideal shape for manifesting demons. That's why Masonic altars are all built in a trapezoidal shape. That's why haunted houses often have roofs that are called mansard roofs. It seems to attract more demon spirits. Now here's the deal. You put this on top of this and you've got the thing that's back on the dollar bill. But notice something. Let's go back to the original symbol. Why is this incomplete? What does that mean? Nothing in this thing is there by accident. Nothing in this symbol is there by accident. This is incomplete because the capstone is missing. What did Jesus Christ say in Matthew 21? He says, Did you never read in the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected the same has become the head of the corner? Now I ask you, what is the head, what stone can be a headstone and a cornerstone at the same time? The top of a pyramid. And Jesus Christ is the capstone of this pyramid because it is an expression ultimately of the Trinity. That's why this is in the way. Satan thinks by putting his little idol here, he can keep Jesus Christ from descending to the earth and assuming his rightful place as the top of the pyramid. And there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. In the next couple of verses, he says, in verse 44 of Matthew 21, he says, Whosoever shall fall upon this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to a powder. Now what does that mean? Well, think about it. If you have a stone that's shaped like a pyramid, if you fall on it, you're going to break like that. If it falls on you, it's going to crush you to a powder. And I submit to you that what that is, is a, an image, a biblical typology of the first and second coming. Because the first time Jesus came that we might fall on him 
and be saved and be broken like we talked about earlier. The second time he's coming, if you aren't a member of his body, bam, you're going to be ground into the dust. No more Mr. Nice Guy, in other words. And that's what this symbol is, and that's why Satan is so desperate to keep this as his symbol is because he does not want this pyramid completed. But we know that no matter what Satan does, it is going to be completed because nothing can stay the hand of God. And that second advent, I believe, is very, very, very close. At this point, we've been talking about child abuse, the, the, the things that surround it, and, and why, the question is, why is Satan doing this? Well, the number one reason is Satan loves to defile innocence. And, of course, a child is always innocent. And ever since the gentleman, I use the word very advisedly, that we talked about last time, Aleister Crowley began doing this, we have seen an explosion of the epidemic of child abuse. And there are other reasons for this. And I'm going to get into this briefly to just kind of finish up what we talked about in our last segment. Um, right now, the best guess we have is that one in four girls is a victim of incest or sexual abuse before they turn 18. One in five boys is similarly victimized. That means that there are about 40 or 50 million people in America that are survive, excuse me, survivors of sexual abuse. Now, there's a, there's a more sinister side of this, which can be either called satanic ritual abuse or Masonic ritual abuse. And about one in 20 victims of child abuse are victims of this kind of abuse. And that, of course, leads to there being two million such survivors. Uh, that's a lot of people. And what Satan's fondest dream is, is that these people will be impervious to the gospel message. He believes because of the way they have been treated, they will distrust God. They will believe that God hates them or that God doesn't care about them because he allowed these horrible things to be done to them. And, and it is only, I think, a testimony to the power of the saving message of Jesus Christ that, that many, many of these people have been saved. Uh, many, many of them are living victorious lives in Jesus. And that is because of the liberating power of Jesus Christ. Now, here's what's ultimately happening. Um, we have found, we have prayed in our ministry for literally hundreds of such people. And, and usually, nine times out of ten, they are completely set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't need years of psychotherapy. They don't need hypnosis. They don't need all of these archaic things that, that seem to be a part of modern psychoanalysis. In fact, some of that, I believe, is counterproductive. Uh, but Satan believes that by doing this, he is, in fact, building an army for Armageddon. Satan has the, the belief, or at least this is what we were taught he believes when I was a Satanist, that if he can get enough people on his side, he can lick Jesus when Jesus comes back with his army for the Battle of Armageddon. Now, that's rather fanciful if you really understand the Bible. Because, first of all, I think it's quite obvious that there probably will be more people on Satan's side than on Jesus' side. Because Jesus warns us that broad is the way to destruction, and many there be that go thereat, and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and few there be that go thereat. But it doesn't matter, because the bottom line is, when we come back to earth with Jesus, we are just the cheering section, amen? He is coming back, and when that 200 million man army surrounds Jerusalem, he's going to come down and open up his mouth, and that two-edged sword is going to come out, and those 200 million soldiers are going to become crispy critters, just like that. And that, he doesn't need an army, because he is God Almighty.